episode of Inspired. I'm Sarah Loudon from Total Health Conferencing, and tonight I'm honored to be joined by leaders in medical advocacy organizations, tonight specifically in cancer. And I'll do a quick intro of everyone on the show, but we will dive deeper uh, as intended uh, to each one of these people, what they do, what, they, what their passions are, and then a little bit about them behind the scenes. So I'm joined by Howard Sewell, Vice President of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, Peggy Burkhart, Executive Director of the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, uh, Andrea Goodman, Vice President of Patient and Family Support for the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. I wanna thank all of you for being with me tonight. Thanks for having us. Sure, so we all have been with each other before on uh, patient advocacy town halls where we kind of reached out to patients early on in this new world we're living in. Uh, and I really was so um, moved by what each of your organizations did, what they represent, and then how each one of you play into the role in these various size and types of organizations. And I thought right away, I really want to come back and do something where we focus on you as individuals uh, so that we get a look behind what motivated you to be in these positions in the first place. Howard, I know the Prostate Cancer Foundation is a little bit unique in terms of the way it advocates for the, ultimately for the patient. And I'd like maybe for you to just give us a couple minutes on what the foundation represents and then why it's unique in the way it advocates on behalf of patients. Thank you very much. So the Prostate Cancer Foundation was actually founded in 1993 by a financier and philanthropist, Michael Milken. And we've raised um, uh, nearly a billion dollars to fund uh, highly leveraged research in academia that's led to um, ultimately all the FDA approvals for new life prolonging um, treatments for men with advanced prostate cancer. So it's, it's been my privilege to be at the scientific helm of this organization for now over 20 years. Um, we, we advocate for patients by providing educational support, by providing uh, content on our website, pcf.org, that gives, gives patients um, uh, the, real, the real story, you know, in the journey of, of cancer from, from diagnosis all the way through to, to advanced metastatic prostate cancer in a way that is consumer friendly, easy to understand, well illustrated. Um, during this period of COVID-19, which affects cancer patients somewhat disproportionately who can't go to hospitals for certain kinds of treatments, um, we've, we've provided a, um, a supplement to our, our uh, very well-reviewed patient guide that helps patients understand what they can do during the, this crisis to, to protect themselves and promote their health. But the, the, the main thing that our organization does is fund science. And as a scientist, I am um, so privileged to be in back of literally hundreds of millions of dollars in funded science um, today um, and tomorrow as well. So PCF is my privilege. That's wonderful. You know, it's so interesting. The, the way the foundation kind of works and supports, it's so different. And I think, I think that's what makes advocacy so unique. I mean, people use the word advocacy organization with this really broad brush. Um, and an advocacy organization can be a support group, you know, a local support group that meets once every month to discuss, you know, challenges in quality of life. Um, it could be a group of school age kids that kind of adopt a cause um, and work tirelessly towards that, um, the mission that they set out for themselves. It could be a, a lone survivor that says, you know, I don't, want, I don't want people that are experiencing what I'm experiencing to go alone or to feel alone. 
all the way up through organizations like yours, all three of yours, where it's well structured, it's run very much like a business in terms of having the right support, the right communication and marketing, um, public relations, fundraising. But at the end of the day, you know, what's so powerful to me, I think, is that anyone with a passion to support another, another person, another cause, animals, anything that's outside of yourself, you are an advocate. And I love that we're able to kind of scratch beneath the surface individually to the three of you and the many others that we've worked with in showing or telling the story of how you each became advocates. So, you know, before I move on to Peggy, I just wanted to say that, that it's not this big grandiose thing that people have to say to themselves, oh, you know, I don't have time or that wouldn't fit my schedule or calendar. It's like being an advocate really just means that you care about standing up for and providing a shared voice for another person or another thing. And so Peggy, as we go to you, I'd like you to just talk to us a little bit about your, your organization. Uh, and then as we round out a little more about Colorectal Cancer Alliance with Andrea, then I wanna really get into the interview, which is getting to know more about each one of you individually. So Peggy, I'll just ask you to spend a couple minutes on what the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link is and how you advocate for patients. Thank you. So the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link was established in 1992, similar to Howard's organization. Uh, Myra Jacobs was, the, Jacobs was the founding executive director. She had a friend who needed a transplant and had a young daughter. She was a single woman uh, on her own with her daughter. And Myra uh, just decided that she needed to help find a way to help her figure out the help she needed to get her transplant across the country. And that's really how the link was born. It's we provide psychosocial, emotional support to patients throughout the entire transplant journey. So from the minute they find out they need a transplant through, I mean, we have survivors 25, 30 years out who are part of our network uh, that just, they, they're peers, they, we, we offer peer support, uh, programs, podcasts, lunch and learn programs, call-in programs, uh, webinars, books, audio books. So, and mostly everything is free for the patient and accessible through our website. So we're, we're really working hard to help the person that lives in a small town that maybe doesn't have access to a great transplant center post-transplant, that they can go on our website and they, could, they can read 30 bl different blog posts. They can listen to all the recordings and podcasts and watch the webinars and get every last thing they need to know about graft versus host disease or late effect transplant or relapse or chemo brain or feeling very alone if you're a youngster. So I'm very proud of the work we do and, and how we are able as a national organization to just help so many people across the, across the globe, really. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Andrea, can I go to you? I've worked with Colon Cancer Alliance now on a number of things and I kind of feel like I'm, I, I know the team and I've fallen in love with a lot of the team. So uh, if you could share a little bit about what the Alliance does and how it advocates for patients, that would be wonderful. Sure, Sarah. Yeah, I share your admiration for the team. I joined less than a year ago and I, like Howard said, I feel like it's an honor to work for the community and the organization. Um, but the Colorectal Cancer Alliance has also been around for quite a while. It's about 20 years old and we're the largest colorectal cancer advocacy organization. So we serve in three main areas. Our pillars are screen, care, and cure. So we focus on um, screening, of course, because it's a highly preventable disease. So um, we focus on awareness around screening and the importance of screening. We actually move people to screening and enable some of our patients or individuals who are interested in screening to obtain um, uh, colonoscopy and other screenings. And then we're also really focused on reducing the stigma as a barrier to prevention in this space because we know that unfortunately there still is one that 
serves as a barrier to saving lives. So that is one core component of what we do. We focus on caring, of course, for the patient population, which is really the kind of traditional um, aspect of advocacy, as you mentioned, Sarah, the kind of like support group model. So we have a helpline, a variety of different digital services, a really robust um, patient education portfolio to make sure that patients in treatment, in survivorship, their caregivers are getting um, what they need. And then cure, of course, because we're focused on um, finding a cure. And we know that that's possible um, in our lifetime. And we want to make sure that we are enabling research that makes sense to answer patient-generated questions and that we're working really closely with the research community to make that happen as kind of a key um, insight channel into patient um, information, patient reported outcomes, and um, patient preferences. So that is a really important value of ours as well. And I'll just lastly say that I just, I think you made such a poignant comment about the different facets of advocacy. And so we do kind of talk about these three pillars of work we do at the organization, but they're so interrelated, right? So like, while we're caring for people, we are also thinking about working towards a cure using that community of patients to work with us as partners to get there. And the same with screening. We're not gonna change um, the landscape of screening rates without working with our community of advocates to get there. So we really don't think about it as this top-down serving the community model. It's really in partnership. Yeah, and it's, you know, I see that live out um, with CCA because so many of the patients that are involved, they really get involved. and you can't, you can't do it alone. You know, it's it, being a patient myself for an autoimmune disease. I know it's so difficult to hear somebody else who hasn't walked in my shoes, give me advice on anything, you know, whether it's drink this tea, try yoga, you know, don't worry, the pain will go away, whatever it is. It's like, you know, their heart is in the right place, but if you don't hear it from someone who's walked in the journey you're on, sometimes it's very difficult to receive it. Um, and I think that that's why it's so powerful, especially like, you know, with what you all do and the, um, the link, Peggy, there's so much like patient to patient involvement. I don't know if that's the same, um, Howard, with you, but as I move to the question that I'm about to ask to you, I, I, would, I am curious to know how patients fit in, if there is a patient um, component, but as you answer that, I also want to ask you, how did you get involved in this 20 years or more ago? So two questions for you. Well, the, the, um, how did I get into this? Um, I was running, a, a our research and development organization at a biotechnology company. And I received a phone call from Michael Milken and it's like, gee, that's interesting. Why does he want to talk to me? And the man came on the phone and, um, and we talked for about, about 15 minutes. And he told me about this nascent organization that he had founded on the diagnosis of his own prostate cancer. So he was very, um, you know, very deliberate about his motivation. He um, um, wanted to, an, an individual that had um, an understanding of the drug development process, who was also a decent human being that had compassion for patients. So I know I know the drug development process. I think I'm a compassionate person most of the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, we had a series of meetings and got to know each other. The organization was raising a lot of money, but it was, it was kind of unstructured in the early days. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes nonprofits a little longer to find their land legs. I don't know what my, my colleagues on the call have found about their organizations, but with Mike, nothing, um, nothing is too hard, nothing, nothing is too expensive, and nothing is unattainable. He is a force of nature. So I just, you know, I, I, on my second or third meeting with Mike and the, the then CEO of the foundation, it was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I think I'll do this for about five years. 
Well, that was over 20 years ago, and I'm still doing it. So that's that that either says the foundation is really good or my judgment is really bad. And I think it's that the foundation is just that good. Um, you know, the, the number of medications that prolong life. Before this, this, this conference, I gave a talk to a major pharmaceutical company. They brought like a hundred of their scientists and they were just interested in what our foundation had done. What have you guys achieved? And when I put up the list of medications that had our fingerprints on them, it's like, wow. So what, that's what we do good. What we could probably do better, to be honest with you, because we've spent so much time, resource and energy on finding the best science, finding the best scientists, finding the best physicians. We've, we've, we've really ramped up our interface with patients in ways that are very positive. And as I said earlier, education. Education is the best patient guide for prostate cancer that you can imagine. Um, it is just so well, I wish I had had more to do with it. I, I vectored some of the professionals that, that critiqued it and helped help uh, review it for veracity, accuracy, and that keep it up to date. But the team that we have on board that produces these things is, is just A plus, really good. Um, you know, we're interacting with people more. In this period of, uh, we, we do some really big, high-end events each year. Can't do those this year. Some of them have, have worked out on Zoom okay. But some of our fundraisers have come up with really unique ideas how to do fun things. So one of our big events is with Major League Baseball each year. Baseball ain't what baseball was. So Major League Baseball and going to all 30 ballparks and going into the booths and talking to patients with the with the sports announcers isn't gonna happen. But how about walking the bases, you know, virtual walking the bases. And our team came up with the coolest idea how to do this. Well, we can't have the home run challenge this year, but you can walk the bases. And it was a challenge to walk like 42 miles in 30 days. And while they're doing it to raise money and it raised, you know, a, a really impressive amount of money considering it was done for the first time and it didn't have the costs of the, you know, a banquet hall in a high-end hotel in New York. It didn't, none of those costs. It was just two, two women with a great idea in our organization that said, we're going to do this. What do we have to lose? And they had everything to gain and they gained a lot. Well, that, that's what's so, I think that's what's so impressive at this time. I was listening to a podcast where someone said, you know, real change only comes when we encounter, like human beings encounter crisis. That all throughout our life, you know, we have these little kind of compromises that we make, but real change doesn't happen unless and until we feel forced, like we feel like our back is against the wall. And, you know, when I first heard it, I thought to myself, I don't know that I agree with that. And then everything that I thought about that kind of promoted these big sweeping changes, I thought, oh yeah, that happened, that was the catalyst, that was the catalyst. And so it kind of made me feel like, well, I wonder what the cat, I wonder, you know, what this, what this that we're living in will be the catalyst for it. It's so many things, but you know, Peggy as Howard was talking, it's, it's the catalyst for people like us that have always been people comfortable living in the background, supporting something. It's the catalyst for people like us to flex our creative muscles and say, we're not going to be stopped. Like we still have really incredible work to do and important work to deliver. And so while we've been doing it in our typical ways, now that we can, not all that means is we've got to get more creative. So Peggy, as you're thinking of your journey in advocacy, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got into this position and then what personally, what this is kind of catalyzing you as an advocate uh, to do, to think, to behave uh, in this time. So I worked in the solid organ transplant for 20 years for the Gift of Life Michigan Foundation and uh, organization, I'm sorry. And I was a, had my own business. I was a PR person and got involved in that. And then I saw the 
the job announcement for this job. And I, I went on the interview and I just fell completely in love. Again, it was the gift of life all over again, but a different gift, the gift of marrow. And, you know, when my kids, I have three kids and when they were younger, uh, the, the customers I love the most, I, were, I started a business from home so I could be home with them. I still, I think I worked twice as hard, but uh, what I learned was the, the, when I worked with the nonprofit groups, it didn't feel like work and it felt so rewarding. If I had to be away from my three kids, five and under, at least when I was doing rewarding work, it wasn't, I felt less guilty to be perfectly honest from being, you know, not being able to be with them. And I fell in love. I just truly fell in love with being an advocate. And for me at the link, the creativity is what keeps me going. Be, being able to create the different programs and just identify the need and have so much freedom to be creative and see the numbers. I mean, the numbers, the proof is in the pudding. When we start to see the registrations, we have a lunch and learn tomorrow. We have 365 people registered to hear about GVHD. You know, some months we don't get those numbers, but then they're recorded, they're on our website. It, every one of them is not gonna be a home run, but we're addressing a need and giving them resources that they would never have access to. and it is just so incredibly rewarding and energizing and it just makes me want to come up with another program. Um, and that's the best way I can explain it. It started really as feeling less guilty and it turned into a, a you know, a love affair. <laughs> I love it. And you're so right. You know, when we started this podcast and I think all of us can think about a, an initiative we started or we started doing since COVID you don't know what's going to come of it. And, you know, as we're counting numbers, you say, oh, there's going to be 300 people on this, this program you have tomorrow. I mean, this uh, upcoming program, but you don't know if sometime a month from now, someone newly diagnosed, someone really struggling to find information won't come across that. And because of the environment we're living in, where all of our stuff almost becomes like this enduring library of resources, you're going to change their life. And so for the 300 plus people that are on, it's wonderful. But for the person who didn't even know that they needed it yet, that's really where I think a lot of what we're doing um, kind of pays it forward automatically without us even thinking about it. And so it's, it's this never ending gift to advocates, I think, to be able to engage in things like this, where other people will encounter it at a time that they need it. Um, so true. Andrea, you are new to the uh, Colorectal Cancer Alliance. I know not very new, and especially now it probably feels like every day is one month. So you've been there for uh, 35,000 months. Um, tell us how you got into advocacy and um, you know, what, has, what has catalyzed in your life in terms of being a change agent. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had such a, as clear of a path and trajectory as Howard and Peggy just spoke to. Um, I actually, this is my first role in oncology. So in lots of ways, I'm not a subject matter expert in my current role, but I've come from, I actually come from both the social work and public health disciplines. So I started my career in social work doing some individual um, work with clients and then moved into public health, which I really feel like is my kind of calling now. Um, and I've, working, I've worked really across kind of health issue areas um, over the last um, 15 years or so. I'm like, how long has it been? Um, but I guess to give the most authentic story about why I'm in this space, I would have to give credit to my family because my grandparents and my parents, I've, I come from a long line of labor organizers and really activists mm -hmm. for civil rights and you know other topic areas and really just grew up with this value around um, supporting our most vulnerable populations. And so it took me a while to figure out exactly how I could support um, different communities in doing that, but I feel really honored now to have found um, many communities now, but especially in the Alliance, a way in which I can strategize and work kind of at the most macro levels and also have a connection to the patient community to be able to see the benefits of that work and how we're changing people's lives. So um, that's really what's most important to me. And I would say 
a few areas that are important to me and the organization that have come up um, most recently in terms of the way we've pivoted during the crisis. I love the way you say, Sarah, that um, real change happens in crisis. And it's like, you don't want to believe it, but it's really true. And it allows us to be innovators in a way that I think we would have been fearful of before. Um, so I would just say, you know, I, I, there's a few core principles that stay with me that are emerging for us more than ever. One is around equity, um, and, you know, making sure that we're being equitable in our approach, in our lens and in our actual services. And then another is around, um, health literacy and making sure that we're kind of matching the literacy needs and requirements of our population. I think sometimes we want to do that and we forget on a daily basis. So I think that's a really important foundational aspect that I always come back to. And then lastly, in terms of kind of my historic role in this space, I would say is just meeting people where they are um, has always been, I mean, we say that a lot in social work, in all of these fields really, in patient advocacy about meeting people where they are, but it truly drew me to this field because I knew that I'm a relational person and I knew there was something about how professions are set up that's kind of intimidating to somebody. And there's something really important about a field that starts with the person instead of starting with an algorithm or a process or whatever, and then trying to like force it um, on a community. So I think that's something that's really important that's come out of this crisis is our rethinking how we're really meeting people where they are because we can't have them come to us now practically or otherwise. Yeah, no, that's, I think that that's a really good point. And it keeps us accountable uh, in ways that we probably weren't so much thinking of, especially in kind of like corporate advocacy, where it's a lot of check boxes. Did we, did we have the race? Did we raise the money? Did we, you know, it's like check, check, check. But at this time, it's like, are people engaging when they have other things they can be doing and measuring oh, well, that was powerful because it resonated in, you know, the lives of people who need this, this right now. Howard, I'm going to kind of turn the table a little bit and ask you um, a question that I, I, I find myself asking of myself a lot lately, which is when things are tough, when things are hard, it's all of us are living in this unprecedented time where we could not have even expected, anticipated what things would feel like. Um, when things are particularly tough, what do you draw on to push through and almost remember what you're here to do? Uh, I think I think it just comes from our, you know, professional um, survival instincts. Physicians and scientists learn to survive. Part of their training is survival. And one of the things that we did um, as a team early on, um, Mike Milken had everybody, all of his enterprises all over the world pivoted to COVID-19. So, you know, we're used to thinking about oncology day and night, seven days a week. And now all of a sudden, we're thinking about this little particle upon which 10,000 will fit on the head of a pin. What are you going to do about it? And we drew on, on knowledge bases. And I'm happy to say there are two clinical trials, actually three clinical trials that are opening as we speak, um, one in New Haven, one in... in um, uh, Los Angeles and one one in England in London that actually um, have my signature on them that will be uh, COVID-19 clinical trials. Now, these these particular treatment and prevention strategies that are be testing in patients actually are 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 based on things we learned from prostate cancer. So I'm not going to get into the sciency part with you, but it's not like we started from scratch even though I do have a PhD in virology. So one of the things we did, and we raised money around this too. So one of the things that we did in this very uncertain environment is, well, let's see, the new cycle for anything other than COVID-19 is like zero. Nobody's paying attention to anything but COVID-19. 
So let's do something on COVID-19 and let's do it big and bold and bright. And I think we have, but now it's time to get back. And um, my, my end point was giving this talk to this pharmaceutical company today. I'm thinking full-time uh, oncology because that's what we do and that's where the patients need us. And God willing, um, the coronavirus will get under control with good public health. Yeah. I'm say, know, Andrea, I just wanted to say, you, you mentioned public health. Um, you know, my background is in virology and epidemiology, actually from a large public health department at Baylor College of Medicine. So we all draw on our past and maybe you are too, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, I interviewed the director of the Emory Winship Cancer Center last night. He's a radiation oncologist, Wally Curran. That, I mean, really, really powerful guy. I know him well. Unassuming, uh, you know then, unassuming guy, funny, but so powerful uh, when you think of his contributions. And, you know, he was saying, Howard, you reminded me, he was saying that, you know, a group got together and said, what could the role of radiation, like a simple small dose of radiation be to kind of protecting and preserving lung function um, different than the way we're treating these patients that kind of come in with, you know, and he said that there's some clinical trials around giving this dose uh, and that it's fantastic. It's early, but it's fantastic. And I said to him, you know, when I went to my rheumatologist and I was talking to her about um, being on a biologic and, you know, I was panicked in the beginning saying like, I'm Absolutely. so susceptible. She said, well, you are more susceptible, but what we think we know about the virus is that the cytokine storm that is what really brings the patient down, the biologics natural path is to suppress those types of storms. So you're protected. And we are thinking as a rheumatology community, how do we translate what is happening in our patients with autoimmune diseases to what's happening with this overexpression of immune response? So as you were talking, Howard, I was thinking, it, it, the world has become so much more connected and so much closer in that we're all thinking of strategies where we draw upon what we know to contribute to fixing this crisis that is happening. And I love that the work uh, of the foundation is, is, you know, hugely three clinical trials, incredible, congratulations, um, moving, moving towards that too. I, I really appreciate that. And I, I thank you for all that you and your team are doing. Um, Peggy, you know, along the same lines of what I asked Howard in terms of what you draw from when you have hard times, as an individual, um, you know, how do you, how do you find ways to kind of protect your mental health, protect your physical health while we are living in these times where, you know, you almost have to, you could be sitting in your office until 9, 10 p.m. because What's stopping you? No one's clocking out. The coffee machine isn't running dry. It's kind of like there are no guidelines or guardrails anymore. So how do you focus on being the advocate for your own health? Great question. Um, I don't really have a hard time with the, the work balance. I learned a long time ago working from home that if you don't turn it off at a certain point, I, you, 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 you just killed now. So I, I really try hard not to do that. I'm always thinking about what I'm doing, but I try to turn it off at a certain time every day. I've got little pieces of paper everywhere. If I think of something, I've learned to, to write it down and then I can go till the next day because I'm not afraid I'm going to forget or even the notes on my phone. Um, but I, I don't really struggle with that, to be honest. I, I think the patients know family around the corner and a caregiver and the feedback that we from our patients, the emails, the phone calls, the survey, you know, when we do ask for a survey, it just, it really sparks me to keep going and to just keep working hard to help these people that are fighting for their lives. Yeah. As I'm sure everyone here can, can understand. I mean, I have been so blessed to not have any sort of health crisis. I'm surrounded by, especially lately, I have 
two friends that are very sick. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's balance. Um, I walk a lot every day. I, you know, I just try to find things like golf just to have that, that work balance. So I don't burn out. And I think not being a founding director, um, and not that Myra burned out, but I think when it's your baby like that, yeah. it's a it might be a little bit different. Um, of course I have long days. There's days you have a board meeting after you worked all day and, but you go to bed with a smile on your face that day because you know, it was a good long day and you know, you made a difference. Yeah, no. I, and I think that it's so great that you have to draw on, um, before COVID, you were, you know, even when you first decided to kind of work from home, you have learned some of those things. Like I actually, as you were talking, I was thinking, what a great idea. You know, my mind is always running and then I'm like, oh, let me get to my laptop with this idea. And I love that you just said, no, write it on a piece of paper yeah. and wait for the morning uh, <laughs> to do it. So, I mean, even those little things I think can really change a person's day as they're, you know, kind of balancing between these really high impact roles uh, and needing to take care of themselves. Andrea, that brings me to you. And I want to ask you this as much as, you know, <laughs> I want to hear your advice on it myself. Being a mom of little ones, um, you have two under 10 and balancing between, you know, you've got this job, whereas I think it's probably six, seven months in, the world turned upside down. Um, and then you became a homeschool mom and uh, we all started working from home. And now we are as moms facing the decisions of, do we send our kids back to school? What is school gonna look like? How do we protect these little precious ones from all of the you know, ugly little germs out there that could hurt them and us? Um, how are you balancing being the advocate, being VP of family and, you know, patient and family services, which is so big that you have to kind of carry that banner and then being, you know, CEO of family services at home. How are you balancing that? Yeah. Well, when you say it like that, Sarah, I'm like, I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> I wish I could say like Peggy that I had boundaries around work at home, but um, I'm still navigating that a little bit. Um, I am very motivated by, as we all are, you know, just by the community, like the stories, Peggy mentioning the survey and like just knowing, you know, that we're going to put out new patient education and thinking about who's going to read that down the road. Like I can't not work on that at 9 PM knowing that somebody might see, need that this week. Um, but it's not as unhealthy for me as a person as that sounds, because I do feel like I'm motivated enough by it that it's fulfilling. And I just also have such amazing colleagues who are equally, if not more, committed to doing this work and doing it well. And just so much multidisciplinary expertise around me in our staff and leadership and in our volunteer community, as you alluded to in the beginning. Um, so it's just, I'm very, very motivated. And, you know, while I still struggle with work boundaries, especially now that we're home all the time, um, I've been a mom who has not ever experienced any guilt around that. You know, you see so much dialogue about moms feeling bad for, I just feel like maybe, it, maybe I should, maybe I um, am a little bit too egotistical about that or something, but I just feel very comfortable with the fact that my kids are going to see that I'm not just their mom. And that's probably a good thing for them, especially since I believe in what I do and that it helps people. That's a value I want them to pick up the way I did for my caregivers. Um, and so I think um, that part of the balance has gone really well for me. And of course, um, also having a flexible workplace. You know, I do have a very busy job and um, a very, uh, um, you know, long work day, et cetera, but I feel very supported in my workplace and by my boss and by, you know, the rest of leadership that I might be interrupted in the middle of the day and there goes a half hour and I'm gonna send out those emails tonight because right now I have a crying child, so. yeah. Do what you and, gotta and do. I think a lot of, I think a lot of companies, you know, we used to think like we work for a company or an organization and now it's like become so evident we work for people and those people yes. are experiencing 
for the most part, what we're experiencing. So, you know, they may have different um, structures. Maybe they've got house helpers or, you know, people that kind of help support them in different ways, but they're still home with their kids, their wives, you know, they're going through all of these things. And I think that it's changed the nature of the interactions between leadership and delegates in that if you've got to take time for your health, if you've got to take time for your kids, you got to do it because, you know, that's what's going to make you whole and able to be a, a strong contributor. So I, I hear you when you say that. And I, you know what, I do appreciate too that it's kind of like, you know, as you mentioned, the mom guilt, it's like relieve yourself of that. You know, we're not, we're not trying to create perfect kids. We're trying to keep our families safe right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they watch too much TV or play too much games, it's going to be okay. It's, yeah. you know, they're not, they're going to be okay. So I appreciate that too. And I'm sure the listeners uh, appreciate that. Howard, we're rounding out. We've got about 15 more minutes. So I'd like to spend maybe five minutes with each of you on um, kind of telling the stories. I, I was asked a question recently. Someone said, you know, if, if you had to kind of think about writing a book, what would be some of the, the chapters? What would, be the, what would they be about? And, and how would you structure, you know, how you would want to tell your story of what you do and how you do it? And so from that, I, the question I have is, when you think about your life and you think about what you're doing, what is a memory that comes to mind right away that you would include in a book that you wrote about your life? Oh, I have a lot. And I'll just give you a couple. Um, one would be the young physicians and scientists that we have helped get across what we call the valley of death. This is the time after they're credentialed to the time they are able to get a government grant. And that is a valley of death. It's very, nobody seems to want to fund that. Yeah. So the 300 or so uh, young investigators that we have funded over the last you know, 15 years, 12, 15 years, uh, would be one chapter. Where they are, what they've done, how many hundreds of people each of them have, have positively impacted with their science, with their medicine, with their nursing, et cetera. That would be one. Number two, and I think this is the third time I've said it, the number of, of new medications. And that's just overwhelming to me. When I put this chart up for this pharma talk I gave today, it's just crazy, um, but it's true. So we have, we have helped, helped catalyze so many life prolonging medications and that's positive. And then the third thing would be, um, you know, being a, a, a good role model to my staff to teach them the importance of communicating with people with respect, with accuracy, um, and to turn that communication into an outreach from the foundation with the same respect that we give to each other to educate the public on the importance of of cancer, for us specifically prostate cancer, but as the genes become intertwined, you know, things that are used in colon cancer will be used in breast cancer, will be used in prostate cancer. We're communicating to all patients with cancer at this point. And so that would be chapter three. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for, thank you for that. Peggy, how about you? What would be, what would be some of the overarching chapter topics in your book? You know, my social, my licensed staff social worker said something to me a few months ago that just something I'll never forget. She said, you are an executive director, but you think like a social worker. And I think to do this job that I have with such a small staff and such a big mission and nationally, I think that at first I didn't know what to think of that, to be honest. And when I thought broke it down in my head, I think it was a compliment. And I think to do the jobs we do, it, I had a boss tell me once when I was in my 20s, another thing I never forgot, you can teach people a lot of things, but you can't teach them to care. Uh, 
And I never forgot Mar my boss, Mary, telling me that. And it stuck with me my whole career that I, you know, I, my daughter uh, gets mad at me sometimes. She goes, I've never seen anybody love their work so much. She's like, it's really annoying. Because <laughs> for most people, work is work. But, you know, I really have always loved what I get to do. I don't even, I know that sounds so silly, but I don't feel like it's work. I feel like it's a calling, if that makes sense. And yeah, you're, girl, you're, you're preaching to the choir because all of us <laughs> feel that. I think yeah. everyone in this field loves what we do. It's hard <laughs> at times, but we love it. And, we, and I just feel so blessed to get to do it. And, and like I said earlier, the creativity, the, being able to create the programs is just my favorite, favorite part of the job. And, and we're going with our gut and we, we, we designed some COVID programs for patients. Uh, we switched gears when the pandemic began and we had 300 people tuning in to understand how to deal with COVID and, and be a cancer patient. And, you know, we're just going with our gut and it's working out. And that's, I guess that and would that be- That comes from, that comes from that chapter where, you know, you think like a social worker, which <laughs> I, I do think is a compliment. I think that that's fantastic. <laughs> Andrea, what about you? What would be uh, some themes in your book? Yeah, I think I want to ride on the coattails of that and, you know, say as an individual professional, I would certainly say that the mentors in my life have been life-changing for me. So along the way, I've just had um, so many incredible mentors that have taught me lessons around vulnerability, like this piece about empathy. And I think showing up as a vulnerable person um, is such an important trait. And I think it allows me to do my work better than like posturing in a way. Like I feel very comfortable at this stage in my career, in my life saying like, I don't, I don't know, or I need this type of expertise to supplement something that I do know. And I think that um, I'm a much better professional for it. And I wish that I had learned that lesson early, but I can credit so many mentors for, for teaching me those ropes. And I think a lot of um, people coming up into leadership, especially women, um, struggle with that because you think you need to like show a certain like strength or ability to do something that you're still learning. And we also struggle with imposter syndrome on the flip side where we feel like we're not supposed to be there and everybody else knows these things, especially in this um, industry where we're with a lot of physicians and investigators um, who, you know, have additional credentials behind their name, and there's a lot more clout around those types of roles. And when you're the patient advocate in the room, when you're the patient, when you're the advocate, when you're the patient advocate professional, um, it's seen as a little bit less, um, you know, valuable in a way. I still think that we're moving towards elevating that type of role as equal, um, and so, you know, I would certainly want to share just that journey that I've had around, you know, feeling comfortable with what I'm good at and being vulnerable with what I'm still learning. Yeah. And then on the professional side, I would just say watching the field over the last few decades evolve has been so humbling and energizing in itself. Like patient advocacy used to be that support group model and it was kind of over here. And now we see drug development companies and you know, FDA and others saying, no, actually we need to require it because patient input is that valuable that it needs to be a part of the system. And we can provide support while we're doing all those things, but we cannot create things for the people without the people. Right. Um, so seeing that evolve has just been really incredible and I'm, I'm humbled to be a part of it. Um, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking two things. I, I was with a group of breast cancer, uh, metastatic breast cancer uh, disease patients. They all had metastatic breast cancer, all, all these incredible women. And someone said something like, you know, I, it was very hard for me to ask for help. It was very hard for me to kind of share my story. One woman went as far as getting her eyebrows tattooed and wearing wigs because she didn't want anybody to know in her job that she had cancer because she felt like it would make people think that she was weak 
And there was this really tough, she founded uh, an organization called Stupid Dumb Breast Cancer. It's actually mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and she said, she kind of like interrupted the Zoom to say, I just need to say it is strong to ask for help. And it was like, everybody just kind of stopped, but it was another moment for me where I thought to myself, gosh, it is strong because in that moment you are admitting your vulnerability. You're reaching out and asking someone who's better equipped to come in and make a stronger product. And you're allowing yourself to kind of become all of a sudden part of instead of leading. And so when she said that, I thought to myself, if we taught our young girls that earlier, that it's strong to ask for help, that they wouldn't feel ever that, you know, if they seem like they don't know the answer or they need someone's assistant, assistance, that they would automatically feel empowered to do that. So when you were talking, I thought, you know, that is something that's interesting. And another thing you were saying, um, you know, that patients often or patient advocates uh, or patients who are advocates often feel unqualified um, but I would argue we are the most qualified right. and it's up to organizations like mine, educational organizations, instead of thinking of a panel of, you know, do I have enough people of color? Do I have enough women? Do I have enough, you know, tier one thought leaders? Well, I need to start thinking, did I start with a patient? And that was a challenge I gave myself at the end of last year that I wouldn't do programs that would not include patients because why would I? And that only happened when I became a patient. So I agree with you too that, um, you know, the patient has to become the star of the panel because they are. Right. So um, I, I appreciate some of the things that you said, and I know that the Alliance is moving leaps and bounds in, you know, making sure that patients and advocates are well represented uh, in, in the future. Um, Howard, as we close the interview, I want to ask you, um, if you, as you kind of think about next steps, uh, you think about what this looks like on the other side. I heard someone say something and I, st I stole it and I started using it. I hope you all steal it too. The next normal, not the new normal, the next normal, because I'm not sure that any of us are planning what that will be or that it will be new in any way, but it will be what's next. Um, as you think about the next normal um, for the foundation and your work, what does that include? Well, the only, the only thing I really miss is being out in the field. Um, I don't think, you know, the, the lack of being in an office hasn't changed anything except I, I don't burn as much gasoline. I don't waste as much time in Los Angeles traffic. Um, and, you know, we've had rent reduction from our, yeah. from our landlord. So all of those are positive things. Um, what I would like to, and I don't know that I need to return to that, what I want to crawl back to, and it's going to take some time, is being in the field. You know, I was, um, you know, United Airlines likes me a lot. They send me presents. Um, we, we have research all over the world. And it's not the travel, it's just the being there with the people and either hearing about new ideas or helping people to solve problems or to review and critique um, uh, programs that we have funded around the world is what I want to see us be able to get back to. Um, plus having scientific events. Mm -hmm. Our biggest one of the year, which is um, in La Costa, California, would have been in October is going to be virtual. It's about 700 people. It's of its type. It's the best. Um, it's just a great group of people that, that we invite to come and that I will miss. So having face-to-face -face meetings outside of an office is what I look forward to. Yeah. Uh, yes, I agree. I'd like that in our next normal uh, as well. Peggy, how about you? What's, what's the next normal for you and the organization? You know, I think it's, it's finding a way to live uh, 
at least I would, I'm going to guess at least the next year and, and just cracking the code, making sure people are okay mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, patients are, you know, they, our patients know how to live in isolation already, but I think it's just a, a, such a sad time and wanted to hang in there and hang on and reach out and check on, you know, check on our constituents and make sure everybody's okay and make sure they feel the love as we all just get through this together. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And that that is not just the next normal. That's what should be the norm now to pick up the phone, whether it's a friend, a coworker, someone, and just give them a call or send them a text to just say, how are you, capital, how are you doing? right now because you know a lot of us are struggling through this time and putting on a good face uh for the outside world that we see on the other side of our computers but when the you know zoom call ends we go back to a dark place where we kind of have to start to wonder how we get through to the next day so i do think that it is really important to reach out um you know set an intention to reach out to at least one person every day and in that way, going full circle, you are being an advocate. Um, and I think it's that easy. It's that easy to kind of um, put that as top priority. Um, Andrea, what about you? Next normal for you and uh, the Alliance? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I share those feelings. I'm very um, worried about many of our community members and even you know friends and staff members who are feeling lonely. Um, you know, it's a lonely time, it's a dark time. And I think for many of our patients in our community who are going to appointments alone, who are already fearful of death um, and having to experience this health fear on top of that and potentially um, having to navigate that alone, at least physically alone. I hope that we are with them on their journey virtually, but um, I definitely worry about that. And I think we've been creative so far in how we are serving our community in ways that we can. Um, but I, I hope that our, our next normal includes, you know, physical connection. And we're also able to be creative about that, the way people are distance meeting and things like that. We'll have to figure out how to do that best. Yeah. Um, but I'm also really hopeful for all of the silver linings in terms of how we're serving patients. You know, this whole like, meet people where they are. It's part of our value system always, but I think the field that may be much more rigid in some ways, you know, academia and others are being forced into that, you yeah. know, and we, we knew already that like a patient doesn't necessarily want to travel to an academic medical center that's two hours away to enroll in a clinical trial and fill out 8,000 forms and blah, 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 all of those really real barriers. And now that's not going to work anyway. So we have to make sure that the system is kind of flipping. Yeah. And I'm really hopeful that we'll have some things that, that stick and make more sense for people in the long run. Yeah, it's like the intersection between advocacy and policy. Because, you know, you want to make sure that what's right sticks. And the only way to do that is to influence policy, everything from payer to, you know, like you were talking about equality. So I, I think it's definitely, we've got to, all of us that have a voice, we've got to start using it so that we can influence the policymakers so that a lot of these things stay uh, available. Well, all of you know that I never end my interviews without asking something silly. I was struggling as I have been uh, these few months with insomnia. And I turned on last night the um, Food Network and there was a show on, I never saw it before, but it was called The Best Thing I Ever Ate. So Howard, I'm gonna go to you. If you're on that show, what are you saying? Best thing you ever ate. Best thing I ever ate. Um, I, I think it would have to be the corn soup at my son-in-law's restaurant in San Diego. Awesome. And what's his restaurant called? It's called <laughs> Valentina. Valentina in San Diego. Very good. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> Peggy, how about you? Best thing you ever ate? Well, I grew up on the East Coast, so I'm a huge seafood person. And my son uh, was living in Chicago. We went to Carmine's 
and their spaghetti with white clam sauce was the best thing I think I've ever had. <laughs> wow, that just made my mouth water. I, I gotta uh, see if I can recreate that in the kitchen. Andrea, how about you? Let's finish strong. Best thing you ever ate. It's almost dinner time. I can't believe you're doing this to us, um, <laughs> at least on the East Coast. Um, I was going to say seafood too, but I will go back to basics because I'm a New Yorker and it's been a while, of course, since I've been able to travel to New York. So I'm really missing a good New York bagel right about now. I would say oh, Delicious. Oh my gosh. I actually love bagels with lox. Like that's the best thing I ever... I don't care where, I don't care when, if you give me a good Nova platter, I'm in. <laughs> so, well, one day we'll have to go together, Sarah. Yes, we will. We'll, go, we'll, do, we'll do like a national tour. We'll start in New York, have bagel, a Nova platter, good New York bagels, make our way to Chicago, have that amazing clam. Uh, what was the clam linguine? linguine what was it? with white clam sauce. Linguine with white clam sauce for lunch. And then we'll end at uh, Valentina's for the incredible corn soup and probably a hundred other things on the menu. So I really love that you all spent time with me tonight. I love getting to know each one of you more. I know the listening audience has as well. We appreciate everything that you all do each and every day. Um, consider us please always a partner in the things that you do, anything we can do to reach our audience, either with the podcast or in edu medical education, please let us know. Uh, and I really do look forward to the day where I get to meet and hug each one of you uh, in our, whether we're on the food tour or not. And I thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great evening.